We're going to start with Zina Ava, who is actually a little bit sick today. So first of all, a round of applause to Zina for being here at all. She's going to talk about the for poetry in the Middle East. Then we have Nefes Da'a, who is going to talk about transforming education in the Arab world. Pretty cool, right? Then we have Rehab al Hajj, who's going to talk about her experiences in Libya and out of Libya. Then Medic Nasemi is going to talk about the connections between Palestinian refugee camps and Native American refugee camps. Finally, we have Yusuf Tukhan Tukhan, twice the name, just one man. He's going to talk about the new digital Arab generation. So, without further ado, I'm going to introduce our first speaker, who is Zina Ava, and I'm going to hand it over to her. Zina Ava is a Palestinian Adopi writer, poet, public speaker, and activist from London. Her work explores identity, immigration, gender, and life in the diaspora. She founded Warwick University's largest poetry collective, Shoot from the Lip, and she's performed at universities and festivals across the UK and across France as well. She's accrued thousands of views, she's delivered two TED Talks, both talking about identity, and she's written for The Independent. In 2014, she co-founded the website Infidah, with a seven, dot com, seeking to change the narrative of the Middle East. She's worked just about everywhere, at the Houses of Parliament, The Economist, the Iraqi Embassy in Paris, UNESCO, etc. She graduated with a first in history and politics from Warwick University in 2015, and she's currently a Kennedy Scholar at Harvard University studying Middle Eastern Studies. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to you. Let's get a big round of applause. Where I'm from. Where I'm from is a place interlaced with memories and smells. I'm from the land of the dead, locked between two blue-green rivers where shells fall down and terracotta clay flies up, caught in a loving embrace. A metropolis in the air. They say the ground is too dangerous there. It's a place where the pot-bellied official won't say hi unless money changes hands where men drop like mayflies and electricity is a novelty. And it's where my heart is, locked in that pink sun and the bloody holes in the road. I'm from a place with no name. Only those ones, those brave ones, speak its name. They call it something else now, but my father, he was not born there. He was born smelling olive trees and seeing old faces creased like tracing paper with smiles and mosques. He does not recognize it now. And then there are all the deaths. Like the new here-to-stay visitors are bored. They kill us, you know. If you prick us, do we not bleed? The BBC like bulletproofing themselves near us. The joke's on them, though. Nothing can stop you feeling pity or seeing truth. Nothing can protect you from that. Now, I haven't been back to where I'm from. It runs in my blood, but not yet in my brain. Where I'm from, <coughs> sorry. Where I'm from is a place everyone knows, full of life, sound and rain, big red buses, busy red-faced men and menacing youths, the mecca of all tourists and the house of all history, Piccadilly, Westminster, the city, crispy money, pungent cafes, but peel it away and you've got a very different story. A story of misrepresentation, underrepresentation, and little participation where we loot, lie, cheat, steal, where the rich get richer and the poor. Well, you catch my drift. You see me, one person, one head, heart, mind. And yet I stand before you today embodying multiculturalism and diversity where race, gender, religion, language, class all meet. I'm standing before you today with the Iraqi Palestinian Muslim and the British young woman both lined into my palms. Now they can get along in a place so small and tiny. So answer me this, why can't they? Thank you. So that was called Where I'm From, and I wrote it in 2012 at the height of my identity crisis. So my mother came from Baghdad as an asylum seeker during the Gulf War, and my father came from Palestine, twice a refugee, with 200 French francs in his pocket and no homeland. 
Growing up, I could never go home for summers. We used to call family through cracked phone lines and see Iraq, Palestine and, more recently, Syria painted in blood on the BBC knowing that that was where my people were. Now, what I've just offered you there is my narrative, my story. This story of conflicting identities, war-torn homelands and the liminality of life in the diaspora have come to shape my work as a poet, but also, in many ways, my character. I weave these tales of suffering, homesickness and torment into my poetry, but I also incorporate her calls for hope, female empowerment and passion. I see poetry not just as the, not just as the essential expression of myself, but also, in many ways, the lifeblood that connects me to those I have not ever and perhaps will not ever meet. Growing up in the West, I continually read distorted pictures of my people and my culture. The fault does not solely lie at the feet of old and new imperialists, however. Arabs themselves have played an integral role in the erasure of stories. Indeed, in, two in 2002, a UN report showed that Greece, with a population of only 11 million, translated more books from English than the entirety of the Arab world with 350 million. We de-emphasize stories, cu culture, and therefore debate and consensus at our peril. No toleration emerges out of warfare and no peace is nurtured without imagination. If I were to dwell on our misfortunes, I would offer an incomplete and unfair representation of the Arab world. We have a rich and diverse history of art and poetry in the Middle East. From the beautiful and bountiful words of Al Mutanabbi, to my idol Mahmoud Darwish, to newer folk figures like Rafif Ziada and Zuhair Hamad. In my work as a poet, I have seen an entire generation ripe and ready to discover themselves and their homelands through words and through stories. We need art, now more than ever, to remember who we are. We need art to define us so that others don't do a lazy or a cruel job in our stead. We need art to heal not just the wounds of our wars, but to dare to craft the rubbles into the vistas of the future. Our legacy is one of beauty, innovation, creativity, and tolerance. It is our birthright, and it will outlive us. So write, read, and imagine. Policy, business, technology, economics, they all have their place, especially here at Harvard. But don't do the typical Arab thing and tell your children just to be doctors or engineers. Seriously, I was born with that. Tell them to be poets and writers. Tell them that art will nurture their soul, that it will rebuild their identity, that it will stop their wars, and that it will set them on the path to reclaim what is rightfully theirs. Not just as Arabs, but also as humans deserving of dignity. In short, Tell them, listeners, that the pen is infinitely mightier than the sword. Thank you. Thank you once again for coming despite the incident.